Hi everyone and welcome back to Sci248. This is your second online tutorial and today we're going to be looking at correlation. So if we take a second just to take stock of what we did last week, we were looking at a data set that had a range of different variables, some of which were numeric. So these were variables that were on some sort of scale of measurement, so for example height. Some of those variables were also categorical, so they had groupings of some sort, such as, say, eye color, which could be blue or green or brown. Today we're going to just focus on numeric data. But last week with our numeric and our categorical data, we looked at, for the numeric data, was it normally distributed, did it have central tendency, variability, all these other uh, features of normality. And then for the categorical variables, we looked at their frequencies. So how many people were in each group. We looked at how to do this statistically, as well as how to graphically represent this data. This represents one of the first steps in an analysis. And this is often followed by what we would call bivariate analyses. So last week we did univariate. Uni meaning one, variate variable. And then univariates are usually preceded by bivariates, bi being two, variate being variable. So we're looking at the relationship between two variables at once. Correlations is a bivariate analysis for when you have two numeric variables. So today's data set, we're looking at the appearance data set. So this is the syntax we use to load it into Stata. And here I can see all my variables on the right hand side. So from this point onwards, most tutorials were going to follow the eight steps of an analysis. So let's start at step one, thinking about the research question and the hypotheses. If you look through this week's worksheet, you can extract three different hypotheses or research questions. The first is, is a person's perception of how discrepant they are from the cultural ideal of body image to their own ideal for appearance related to measures of well-being? So, what we're asking here is whether or not a person's perception of their cultural ideal or their own ideal for appearance, um, so how important is appearance and whatnot, is that related to measures of well-being? So people place more importance on their appearance or they their culture places more importance on appearance. Um, are they more likely to experience symptoms of depression, anxiety, shame, negative affect? Um, could they even have self-esteem issues? The second research question asks, is a person's degree of internalization of the cultural ideal related to measures of well-being? And then finally, the third research question is whether or not the degree to which the individuals prioritize appearance over physical competence related to measures of well-being. So we have three research questions, they're so all re related in some way, um, but at the same time they're all slightly different. One thing to note here is that we have three research questions, but we don't technically have any hypotheses. So the difference between a research question and a hypothesis is a research question is a general statement, is x related to y, and that's very much how the correlation questions are set up is internalization related to measures of well-being? So that's research question two. A hypothesis, on the other hand, rewrites the research question with an expected outcome. For example, the stronger a person's degree of internalization of cultural ideals uh, will result in stronger measures of depression or, or higher scores of depression. So a hypothesis has direction built into its statement Whereas a research question is just a general question. Moving on, we need to ask ourselves, what is the sampling population? For this study, if we look at the worksheet, we're told that the data come from a group of women attending universities across the northeastern United States. So that statement alone is enough for sampling population. Okay, if we move on, let's talk about step three. Absolutely flying through this stuff. But step one and two are important. They seem really simple, 
But a lot of students will leave out steps one and two, particularly when they're doing the tutorial, like, like preparing for the tutorials. And steps one and two are so vitally important because later on when we get to more complicated analyses, there will be things in steps one and two that will actually change the approach that you take. So it's really, really important that you take the time to write up the research questions, acknowledge any hypotheses, um, but also to acknowledge who the sampling population is. Step three, data summary. I cannot stress enough how important this next step is. Taking a second to separate out your variables into IVs and DVs is so critically important because once you know this, you know what analysis you're running. You couple this with steps one and two and you know exactly where you're going to proceed. Just by looking at steps one and two, I don't know what analysis to run. But once I couple that with step three, I know straight away where I'm going with this. So, let's talk about DVs. In this particular study, we have five dependent variables. Now, technically speaking, in a correlation analysis, there isn't really an IV or a DV. Um, you just have two variables and you're looking at their relationship. So later on, we'll look at um, correlations between IVs. Not today, but in another tutorial. But if we look at our research questions, and again, this stresses the importance of step one, we can see that well-being comes up every single time. And we're asking whether or not different aspects of appearance are related to well-being. So because it comes up all the time and we're saying that well-being is some product of, you can kind of start to go, okay, well, well-being seems to be treated like a dependent variable, like some sort of outcome. So just as a reminder, a dependent variable is the thing that you're trying to change. It's the, the outcome. It's the variable that you think is influenced by everything else. And so that will often be abbreviated to DV, for dependent variable. An IV, on the other hand, an independent variable, this is a variable that you think is causing the change um, or precedes the dependent variable in some way. So if we think about this particular study, there's five dependent variables, um, and they're all measures of well-being. So we have depression, anxiety, shame, negative affect, and self-esteem. So writing them up like this, this is helpful, but it's also worth just taking a moment to also remind yourself, what is it labeled in the data set and what type of variable is it? What flavor of variable? So for depression, it's labeled CESD and it's a numeric variable. For anxiety, it's labeled STAIT. That stands for the State Trait Anxiety Inventory. And it's a numeric variable. Shame is labeled shame, funny that, and it's a numeric variable. Negative affect is called negative affect, it's a numeric variable. Self-esteem is labeled RSE, it's numeric as well. Now, it shouldn't be any surprise that all these are numeric, um, and I say this for two reasons. The first reason is I told you that we're doing correlations today, and I told you that correlations are between two pairs of numeric variables. But, also two, at least in this course, the only kind of dependent variable you'll be handling is numeric. Then we move on to our IVs. There are four IVs in this study, represented across three research questions. The first two IVs are attached to research question one, IV3 is research question two, and IV4 is research question five. So the first IV is the discrepancy with your own ideal of appearance. Um, this is called own discrep, so the discrepancy of your own ideal, and it's numeric. Our second IV is the discrepancy with cultural ideal. This is called cultural discrep, and it's numeric as well. And I'm missing a bracket. There we go. Internalization of cultural ideal. So this comes back to the second research question. It's called internal, and it's numeric. And then trait objectification. So this is research question three. Um, the degree to which an individual prioritizes appearance over physical competence, we're going to call this trait objectification. It's labeled trait and it's also numeric. Okay, so now that we've looked at our research questions, our sampling population, and a summary of the variables in our data set, we can now take a moment to bring it all together.
So this isn't formally a step, but it's a nice way to go, okay, so what is it that we're looking at? And so what we can see is our research question involves bivariate relationships. And if we actually look at the research question, we can see the word related come up in every single one. This is going to be really, really important when we come to a later analysis, where a different word here could actually mean a different analysis, despite the fact that otherwise the research question is the same. So it's really, really important that we're talking about relationships. The DVs and IVs are all numeric. And this tells me that correlation is probably the most appropriate hypothesis test. Okay, so let's move on. The next thing to stop and ask ourselves, once we know what analysis it is, we, we can also talk about the design. So if we want to talk about the design, I guess there are three different kinds of designs a study could be, very sort of broadly speaking. You can have an experimental design, a quasi-experimental design, but you could also have a correlational design, also sometimes known as observational. Now if the design was experimental, this means that we are allocating people to groups and we're manipulating those groups. So for example, um, people come into my study and I randomly allocate them to a group that either receives cocaine or ice or weed and then I make them go do something like, I don't know, run around in the field for 10 minutes and see how far they run. If I do a quasi-experimental study, this means that I'm still using groupings of some sort, but that they're naturally occurring. So rather than me bringing people into a study and assigning them to receive a drug, it might be that people are coming into a study and I'm using gender as my IV. People will come to my study with a gender that already exists. It would be unethical of me to actually manipulate someone's gender. So people are coming to the study with a gender. So that's quasi-experimental. Correlational and observational designs are those designs where, and correlational and observational mean the same thing in this context, it's simply where we're looking at the nature of the relationship between two things. Um, so we're not manipulating, manipulating anything, we're just measuring things. And so in this study, we're not manipulating depression, anxiety, shame, negative affect, self-esteem. We're not changing discrepancies or internalization. We're simply measuring their naturally occurring levels. And these aren't groupings. So what that means is that this must be a correlational or an observational design because we're simply looking at how things are and we're not manipulating anything, we're not using groups. And so for this particular correlational design, correlation is the most appropriate analysis because the research question involves the assessment of relationship. Um, whereas when we get to regression, we'll see that a correlational design with a research question that involves prediction is about regression.